one of the Thai idioms for meditating. It's Tam Kwan Pian, which literally means making an effort. We're not here just sitting, watching things arising and passing away. There are certain things we want to make arise and prevent from passing away. In other words, we want to make concentration arise, provide the conditions for discernment. The other things we want to make sure they don't arise, and if they do arise, we want to speed up their passing away. Those are the unskillful thoughts that get in the way of concentration. As a group, they're called hindrances. And there are five altogether. Essential desire, ill will, sloth and torpor, restlessness and anxiety, and uncertainty. These things, when they take over the mind, they prevent us from getting into good concentration, which is why they're called hindrances. The problem is, in our ordinary life, we don't see these things as hindrances at all. We actually like them. So the first step in getting past them is to see that they really are getting in our way. We tend to side with our thoughts. We tend to find our thoughts really interesting. So it's important that you learn to see them as not so interesting after all, just the mind chattering away to itself. Often with no sense of responsibility. When you can see things in that way, it's easier to pull yourself out. The Buddha gives five ways of dealing with hindrances, and they can apply to any one of the five. The first is simply recognizing that your mind has slipped off into something unskillful. You replace it with something skillful. In other words, you just bring it back to the breath and try to make the breath more comfortable than it was before. Get yourself interested in the breath again. Because that kind of thought if it, that can be cured simply by giving yourself something new to think about is simply caused by a lack of mindfulness. Your mindfulness has slipped, you're off someplace else, where well, you reestablish mindfulness back where you were before. And then you try to make it extra strong. But there are a lot of hindrances that are not quite so innocent. They come with an agenda. They tell you how important they are. You've got to think about them, or they're good to think about. And this is where you have to use the Buddha's second technique, which is to focus on the drawbacks. And you notice that each of the hindrances has a different set of drawbacks. With Sensuality, the drawback is that you spend all your time, waste all your time, thinking about pleasures that when they actually come are not nearly as good as you make them out to be. When the Buddha talks about sensuality, he talks less about the actual pleasures and more about the fact that we sit there and embroider the possibility of what this pleasure is going to be like and what that one's going to be like, and then after you've had them, then you talk to yourself about what they were like and how great they were. When you really look at it, it's a bunch of lies. You can think for hours about food. When you actually eat it, it's in the mouth only for a little bit. And then when it goes down to pass the throat, then it's something else entirely. And when you can see how the mind's lying to itself so much about these, these pleasures, that helps you see that it's not something you really want to get involved with. As for ill will, the main problem, of course, is that if you have ill will for other people, you're going to do un th unskillful things. You're going to mistreat them, and then that becomes your karma. There's no way at all that you benefit from ill will, wanting to see someone else suffer. You're just burning yourself up with anger at the moment and setting yourself up to, as I said, do unskillful things in the future. There's no reason you should want to be involved in that kind of thinking. Sleepiness is very seductive, because when it comes on, your first thought is, gee, I must be tired, maybe I should rest. You have to test it. 
because all too often sleepiness is hiding something from you. Something may be coming up in the mind, some important insight, but part of the mind is afraid of it, so it pretends to be sleepy. So you've got to test it, because you're going to miss out on things. After all, nobody ever gained awakening while they were asleep. And they slept before. There's nothing really new about sleeping. So when sleepiness comes on, you want to fight it. Make yourself interested in the breath. Make yourself more interested in the ways the breath can go in the body. Give the mind work to do. And you see that sleepiness is just getting in the way of training the mind. Restlessness and anxiety. The main problem there is that you tell yourself you've got to think about something in the future, prepare for a danger. But all too often, if you're carried away with restlessness, carried away with anxiety, you wear yourself out. Then the mind doesn't have the strength it needs to deal with unexpected dangers that come up. All too often, we prepare for dangers that never happen. Like the cannons that the the British set out to defend Singapore. They thought the Japanese were going to come from the sea, so they put the cannons in cement, aimed out at the sea. And then the Japanese came down the Malay Peninsula, and the cannons were useless. All that money, all that time spent in the cannons, it could have been spent for a better defense. It just went to waste. In the same way, a lot of our thoughts and worries about the future are a waste. They sap our energy, and they don't protect us. As for uncertainty, have to remind yourself it keeps you from committing yourself to anything, because you can be doubtful about anything at all. And what ends up happening is that you never commit yourself and never really find out what's true and what's not true in the practice. So when you can see these drawbacks to these hindrances, that they really are not your friends. They're not even all that interesting. Then you can pull yourself out. That's the Buddha's second method. The third method is if the mind just keeps chattering away. And you just tell yourself, okay, let it chatter, but I'm not going to get involved in the chatter. It's like someone talking in one corner of the room, you're going in the other corner of the room. You focus on your breath. Don't get involved with the chatter at all. Think of it as being like a crazy person talking to you, coming to ask for, for something from you. If you get involved with a crazy person, they pull you in, pull you into their crazy stories. You have to pretend like you don't notice them at all. Same with these thoughts. They can chatter away, but as long as you're not interested in them, you're not giving them extra food. And after all, they run out. Another method is when you begin to notice, as you get more sensitive to the breath, that when a thought appears in the mind, there will be a slight pattern of tension in some part of the body. It might be in the arm, the stomach, anywhere in the body. And it's associated with the arising of that thought. If you can find out where the tension is, you breathe through it and dissolve it away. The thought has no place to stand, it will disappear. If none of these methods work, the Buddha recommends that you put your tongue against the palate, bite your teeth, and then just keep telling yourself, I will not think that thought. If you want, you can use a meditation word, just really rapid fire, puto, 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 really fast so there's no time for the mind to think. Basically squeeze the thought out of the mind. This of all the methods is the one that uses the least discernment. But it's helpful at times. It helps to clear the air. So you've got five approaches to use for the hindrances. This, of course, is up to you to want to use them. That's the most important part. Half the battle is realizing something is a hindrance and you don't want to get involved. If you can get past your 
interest in your own thoughts, and the way you tend to side with the hindrances. In other words, based your persistence, which is one of the bases for success, on the first one, the desire to actually get the mind into concentration and to get past these things. That's half the battle right there. And these techniques then can complete the job. So the effort you put into the meditation really does bear fruit. The mind can settle down. You're not getting worn out by the effort. You use the effort to clear the obstacles for mental stillness, for the strength you're going to develop from the concentration. Because once the concentration gets solid, gets past these things, you end up having more energy than you had before. That's a sign that your effort is right.